You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Be Humane on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Robin Ganser. I hope everyone's having a great week as we wind down summer and our kiddos head back to school for another great school year. I have one entering graduate school, one entering her sophomore year in college, and one entering his sophomore year in high school. So I can tell you, this time of the year is very busy for Gansers. And it's also an adjustment for our wonderful animal friends in our home who will miss the kiddos and miss seeing them every day. Well, this week is the second part in our four-part series, interviewing the 2015 American Humane Association Hero Dog Awards finalists. That's right, friends. We're talking to the handlers of all eight courageous finalists and letting them tell the story of their dog and why their dog is a hero. Each has an amazing tale to tell, and we cannot wait to celebrate their heroic accomplishments in Los Angeles on September 19th. And for those of you unable to join us in person, you can watch it all on Hallmark Channel as part of a two-hour primetime special on Friday, October 30th. Be sure to mark your calendars, tune in, and set your DVDs to record if you're not at home on that Friday night. It's not going to tell you this is a very special family evening as we celebrate the power of the human-animal bond. Up first today, my colleague Scott Sowers will be talking with Lisa Phillips, the mom of MWD Rambo, winner of this year's Military Dog category, sponsored by Zoetis' Remedal Canine Courage Program. And you know, as we uh, think about military dogs, we all remember the wonderful work that American Humane Association has done on Capitol Hill, really encouraging changes in the regulations and rules that are really promulgated under the National Defense Authorization Act. Let's all keep our fingers crossed as we go into this fall that our president signs the NDAA into law, allowing all military working dogs to be returned home for their retirement. And later on in the show, you'll hear from Keith Lynn, whose dog, Glory, is our top arson dog of the year, sponsored by our friends at State Farm. But first, let me tell you about a very somber anniversary that you have no doubt been reading about lately. Yes, 10 years ago today, New Orleans and places all around Mississippi, Louisiana, and elsewhere were reeling from a devastating blow by Hurricane Katrina that made landfall on the Gulf Coast in late August. This deadly storm took more than 1,800 human lives and displaced or killed a staggering 250,000 pets. Friends, we remember this. We remember this devastating blow, not only to the area from a property damage, but also to the human spirit. What we saw in the Gulf Coast, New Orleans area was just heart-wrenching and heartbreaking for humans and animals alike. Our Red Star Rescue Team, which is celebrating its 100th birthday in 2016, was on the ground to rescue, shelter, and care for many of those pets. But this storm changed the way animal rescue during times of disaster is done in this country. In the aftermath of the storm, many individuals and animal rescue groups took upon themselves to deploy to the damaged areas to help rescue animals. But in doing so, those groups were disorganized and they weren't invited by local, state, or national authorities as is required. And they really created a bigger problem, as they say. There needed to be a way for major groups to use their resources and expertises collaboratively and to ensure that rogue groups would not take action into their own hands. So groups like American Humane Association, other groups like ASPCA, Red Rover, AVMA, Best Friends, and more formed the National Animal Rescue and Sheltering Coalition. So when a major disaster like Hurricane Katrina Hurricane Sandy, affecting thousands of animals, we all stand together on a united front to pitch in and help. You know, that's really important in times of crisis. And there's still plenty that pet owners around the country can do to help their four-legged friends, especially during times of disasters. You know, you can always become a volunteer for one of these fine groups and their disaster response teams. So look up American Humane's Red Star training programs around the country and other groups like ASPCA, Red Rover, AVMA, Best Friends. They all have incredible volunteer networks that respond in times of disasters. So if you want to help and want to be a volunteer, sign up for our certified programs very helpful to get that kind of training. Also, American Humane Association is teaming up with the Weather Channel and Mobi Pet to unveil 
new high-tech visual Amber Alerts for Misting Pets that not only will help reunite lost pets with their owners, but will also help to raise funds to help animals in need all across our wonderful country. Mobile Pet is the first mobile image and information service designed to increase the chances that families will find their lost dogs or cats. How cool is that? You know, technology is really amazing. Pet owners can register via computer or a mobile device, but they must use a smartphone or or a text-enabled cell phone to submit a lost pet alert. Owners simply upload their pet's image and contact information at mobipet.me, that's M-O-B-I, P-E-T dot M-E to register each pet and receive the web app for their phone. You know, that's so incredible that technology allows us to have a chance to notify our neighbors and let them know that our beloved animal friend is lost. So if your dog or cat runs off, you can simply text the word lost to a special email address, which will send out the alert to everyone on the lookout for your lost animal. Basic subscribers lost pet alert will trigger to an immediate email blast to their vet and all registered pet owners and pet finders in a two-mile radius or to their registered community. Premium services will reach, gosh, a 30-mile radius. How wonderful is that? Any pet owner who loses a pet in a disaster area to which Red Star deploys and who owns a smartphone or text-enabled cell phone can go to their websites of Mobile Pet. The Weather Channel and American Humane Association will upload their missing pets' photos from the owner's computer or cell phone. Wow. The power of using Mobile Pet to reach the Weather Channel and American Humane Association allows us to reach even more to help find those wonderful animals who happen to be lost in such a terrible time. Non-registered owners whose pet become lost can also access the service for an emergency registration fee during a Red Star deployment. Mobile Pet is going to waive those fees within the disaster area. That's an incredible, generous offer from this company. In addition to disasters, this new service will also help find pets who are lost in the normal course of life. Some 10 million dogs or cats are stolen or lost in this country every year. In fact, my neighbor's beloved dog just around the corner has been lost now for three weeks. He's offering a $1,000 reward to get his best friend back home. I think that dog might have been stolen. It's very, very sad. Again, some 10 million dogs and cats are lost or stolen in this country every year. And the Mobile Pet Partnership aims to increase the number of happy endings to these traumatic episodes. I'm hoping my neighbor gets a happy ending soon. Remember, those microchips are invaluable tools as well in helping reunite lost pets with their owners. But the information always has to be kept current. How many of us have found an animal, gone to our vet with the microchip, and the pet owner has moved? But they're only good, again, if the chip is scanned and the correct information is in the database. Well, thanks to our friends at Mobile Pet, 15% of their proceeds will help American Humane Association continue our life-saving work. Remember, visit mobilepets.me, M-O-B-I-P-E-T-S dot M-E. It could save your furry friends' lives. And speaking of saving lives, our friend Scott, our correspondent on the road with our hero dogs, will be right back with Lisa Phillips, whose dog MWD Rambo has done just that. And then some. You're listening to Dr. Robin Ganser. This is Be Humane on Pet Life Radio. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. Do you know that moment when your dirty dog's about to jump in your nice, clean car? You can avoid all the cleanup and mess with a 4K9 seat cover. 4K9 makes heavy duty seat covers and cargo liners that will blend seamlessly with the interior of your vehicle. You can find us at 4K9s.com, that's the number 4, K-N-I-N-E-S.com, or on Amazon.com. 4K9s makes nothing but the best for your best friend. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to the show. So glad you're listening today. I'm Scott Sowers, executive producer of Be Humane with Dr. Robin Gansert, and I'm filling in for Robin today. Our first guest of the day is the third in our series interviewing this year's Hero Dog Awards finalists. The U.S. military has been working with dogs for centuries, and it's clear why. Their noses are thousands of times more powerful than yours and mine, able to find deadly hidden weapons, and it's estimated that each dog in service to its country today saves an estimated 150 to 200 lives. The winner of this year's military dog category, sponsored by the Zoetis Remedil Canine Courage Program, has surely done that and then some. 
military working dog Rambo is a true hero in every sense of the word. And I've got his mom, Lisa Phillips, on the line now. Hi, Lisa. How are you doing today? Hey, Scott. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. And how's our hero dog Rambo doing? Rambo's doing excellent. He's just kind of hanging out right now next to me. So Rambo had an amazing career serving in the Marines from January 2011 to April 2012 as an explosives detection dog. Can you talk a little bit about his brave service to our country? Yeah, you bet. So Rambo served about a year and a half in the Marine Corps, just as you said, and he was an explosive detection dog and also patrol certified. So that means that he would be able to, while on patrol, detect any pieces of an explosive device or also if there was an assailant coming at his handler or another person, he would be given specific commands and would attack and take the assailant down. He has over 600 stateside searches and two missions. So he did quite a bit in his short time and until he was injured doing what they call decoy work, which is when he is attached to the leash with Handler and there's another person with what's called either a bite wrap or a bite suit on. And somehow when he lands it, he ended up hurting his shoulder pretty bad. So months later, they ended up retiring him because of that injury. So his career was cut short, but again, in that time, he did quite a bit for the military base where he was at, which was Cherry Point, North Carolina, also the civilian side. From what his handler told me, they didn't have a bomb dog on the civilian side, so Brandy and his and, uh, and Rambo would go search if there was a bomb call or, or anything off base. Now, I understand that due to his injury, there was uh, an amputation was necessary. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. He was injured pretty severely in his left shoulder. Unfortunately, dogs can't talk to us, so he wasn't able to tell the vet, you know, hey, it's my shoulder. They thought maybe his paw or nail or something to that effect had gotten stuck in the wrap when he landed. And so they really didn't concentrate on the lower, on the upper extremity, they concentrated on the lower extremity. And then I think it was like six or eight months later, they finally took an x-ray of the shoulder. And from what I know, from what Brandy told me, they actually found like some pieces of bone fragments floating around in his shoulder. And so that was causing extreme pain and degenerative joint disease set in which by then, and then that led to osteoarthritis. So I was able to adopt him with four legs. And then about three or four months after the adoption, we ended up deciding to amputate the leg since he was so young. You know, he can live without one leg, but unfortunately the pain medication that he was on could possibly lead to liver and kidney failure. And that was just something I wasn't going to risk. And so how old is he now? He is now seven. Okay. So once he was retired, how did he come into your life? So it's pretty. It's a pretty amazing story how we got connected. One of Brandy's friends, well, I shouldn't say necessarily a friend, but acquaintance, had adopted a dog from Cherry Point. So she reached out to him saying, hey, we got this special needs dog because Rambo has a few other issues other than his, his leg. You know, so she didn't want him just going to any family. She wanted to make sure that she researched and the family who was adopting him knew what they were getting into and was, I guess, capable of not just the financial aspect, but also the time that Rambo would require for, for his medical issues. So... This person reached out to me and was like, hey, you know, we got this special dog. So we were looking and looking and I was putting the word out and we really couldn't find anybody to adopt him. And at the time I had, I think, two large dogs and a small dog living with me and cats. So I kind of had a house full. So I was like, I can't, you know, take care of him. And so I was talking on the phone with Brandy, seeing what she felt comfortable with, you know, well, what if we can find a foster if we can't find anybody to adopt him yet? You know, I'll come get him and we'll have a foster here in San Antonio, Texas. And then hopefully we can get him adopted out. Well, things ended up changing and one of my dogs actually got incredibly sick and passed away. So it just kind of worked out that when Diamond was gone, I was able to take Rambo in. And um, Brandy was there the whole way. He knew what was going on with Diamond. And so I think that was just God's way of saying, hey, you took care of Diamond. She was a street dog. You rescued her. And now I have a new dog for you to take care of. So... Rambo, I think that was in yeah May, May of 2012 was when we decided that I would adopt him. And then he ended up retiring in August of the year. And we had a pretty awesome ceremony 
and Congressman Jones came down in his jurisdiction at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, and we were working on the canine members of the Armed Forces Act legislation. So he came down and actually spoke at Rambo's retirement ceremony, and then we held a press conference for the legislation afterwards. So it was pretty amazing, and I felt pretty special because that was the first time they've ever had a retirement ceremony for a retiring military working dog. So it was just really special. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, just as you mentioned, Rambo, even though he's retired now from his career as a military working dog, he's by no means actually retired and he seems to have a pretty full plate. Uh, Let's talk about his role as a mascot of the Alamo Honor Flight. Yes. Yeah. So Rambo, he, you know, these dogs, they're bred to work. Like that's what they desire. That's what they crave. That's what they want. Like they want to work. So I get Rambo at four and I can just tell like he needs to do something. So I was already involved with Alamo Honor Flight and Alamo Honor Flight is part of the Honor Flight Network. We take our nation's World War II veterans up to D.C. to reflect at their memorials. So I've been involved with them for a couple of years. So when they knew I was getting Rambo, the president and founder asked me if Rambo would like to be the mascot. And I said, well, sure. So Rambo was able to fly on the last three flights of Alamo Honor Flight before they ended up shutting their doors because they had flown all the veterans that they had on their wait list. There were, as far as they knew at that time, there weren't any um, veterans waiting to go. So the first flight, we went on four legs, and that didn't go so well. He was in a lot of pain, so we put him on um, in a human wheelchair. And then the second flight at the dinner, we're up there for three days, and then one of the nights, we have a really nice dinner for the veterans. They end up donating a portion to go towards his wheelchair and his prosthetic leg. So that was, like, super awesome, and we reached out to OrthoPets in Denver, Colorado, made a trip up there. We were there for about a week, fitting him with his little wheelchair, a.k.a. his little prosthetic leg. (laughs) And then also he was fitted with a wrist splint for his right front leg. Dogs carry about 70% of their weight on their front legs. So now even though he's a smaller dog, all that weight is on that front leg. And they were afraid that ligaments and tendons over time would start to deteriorate faster because now he only has that one leg. So he has a wrist splint that he wears whenever we go out for long walks or or do events. And that, you know, just stabilizes his wrist a bit. And then so the third flight and the final flight were able to take the wheelchair, but I think he'd only had it maybe two weeks, so he was not thrilled with it and didn't really want to get in it. And that was okay. Like, the veterans loved him, and it was pretty neat. You know, I would walk up with Rambo in the human wheelchair and uh, maybe next to another veteran in a wheelchair, and his or her face would brighten up because... So these, these guys and gals, they're, they're tough cookies, you know, even at 90 some odd years old, they don't want to sit in a wheelchair. <laughs> and sometimes you have to force them to, you know, they want to be strong and they want to show that they still have it. And so by having Rambo in the wheelchair, it kind of gave them, a, oh, okay, well, if this, you know, Marine will sit in a wheelchair, then I'll sit in a wheelchair too. So it was just really nice being able to have Rambo there and, and be with them when they experience this once in a lifetime opportunity to see their um, memorials and and talk to them and they really opened up around Rambo and everybody wanted their picture with them and it was just a really amazing time and we are completely honored to be a part of that. Uh, Yeah that's I mean that's great work you know I live here in Washington so I know all about these honor flights and it's always inspiring to see them down whenever I'm walking past the World War II monument it's it's a beautiful monument if if our listeners haven't had a chance to see it you know it really captures the it's both a somber and a happy um yeah memorial you know it is and I don't know if you noticed there's actually a dog on when you're looking at the memorial like um your back is to the Washington monument I think it is and you're looking into the World War II memorial where the water is. On the right hand side there's actually a canine engraved in the wall. Oh, I did not little, know that, so I'll be on the lookout. Not even at the wall, so. but I think I don't I don't know, maybe that's brass or something, but yeah, there's a dog up there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But Rambo is also the mascot of an organization called Gizmo's Gift. Tell us about this yeah. uh, this nonprofit and what they do. I was a vet tech in the Army, and so my job was to take care of the military working dogs and any military members' pets. But the main mission was, was the military working dogs. They could show that they were healthy and able to do their job and deploy. So my first emergency on active duty was a dog named Gizmo. It was a Memorial Day weekend. We spent all weekend together 
so I kind of like got attached to him and he was just like the coolest dog in the planet. Like I know everybody has that dog. So you guys listening out there, you know that there's that one dog, even throughout all your life, you may have a dog, you know, different dogs come and go, but there's that one dog and Gizmo was the one dog. Yeah. He touched my heart and just completely melted me. <laughs> I mean, he's, I was always an animal lover, but I grew up with cats. I wasn't really a dog lover. And Gizmo was just one of those dogs. And the first thing he did, so dogs, these military working dogs should always be muzzled because sometimes they can get aggressive or scared. And I know my old business, she'll she'll like hit me, but I kind of had like a heart to heart with Gizmo. And I was like, hey, we're going to be here for like four days. You're you're hooked up to IVs. Let's just be cool. Don't bite me, and I won't put the muzzle on you. And he kind of, like, looked at me, gave me this little cute bee eyes. I said, okay, we're good. So (laughs) I took him out to behind the clinic, and there was a little grassy patch, and we're just hanging out. And he was about 80 pounds. He threw his chest on the ground and, like, shoved his butt in my face for me to scratch his butt. And it was just the cutest thing. And I said, okay, we're good. And so just, you know, we would just remain friends and uh, me and his handler. And uh, there was a time, I think it was probably nine months after that health scare, we actually thought we we're going to have to put him to sleep. He was dying of kidney failure. He crashed really bad. And so he ended up pulling through and that's when they decided to retire him. His handler had just gotten orders to deploy. So the kennel master was like, well, hey, Phillips, you know, if you want him, he's yours. And this was when my eyes opened up about the true working dog world, like after retirement. At that point, it was June 2005, and I had already started my medical discharge. I was getting med boarded because of some injuries I incurred while on active duty. And so I'm going through the VA, and I'm like getting my, setting up my disability and all that. And I'm thinking to myself, why isn't this dog getting anything? He served nine years. I served almost five years. And then I realized that they were considered uh, research and found out they were considered a piece of equipment. They were not even a military member, so they can't get anything. So time goes when I adopt him, I actually have to get a second job while I'm working in the Army. So I work at an emergency clinic in the evenings, and so I can have an apartment and make sure that his vet care is taken care of because he was on special food and special medication, and, you know, I couldn't afford that on a E4 monthly paycheck from the military. So I get the, the apartment, and we get set up, and things are going great, you know. He's doing well, and then I think probably the 10th after I got him was when he crashed again, and it was really amazing. Like, the kennel master and a few other handlers came up and were and I put him to sleep. And I promised him then, I said, you know what, Gizmo, like, we need to make a change in the military working dogs' lives. Like, this can't happen. No other dogs should have to go through what you did and not get medical benefits and, you know, be considered a piece of equipment. Equipment doesn't bleed. Like, equipment yeah. is something you can leave out in the sun. You know, like, it's not something, you can't just go get a military working dog off of a shelf. Like, oh, I need a replacement. No, like, that's not how it works. So, yeah. You know, so Gizmo was just really the dog that he was the catalyst, actually, for the canine members of the Armed Forces Act, and that's how Gizmo's gift came to be. So Gizmo's gift is in honor of Gizmo, and it's his way of giving back to every working dog out there, not just military, but police, TSA, Border Patrol, search and rescue, any type of law enforcement. We want to honor them for what they do for our nation, for what they do for our country, and for our community. So our mission is to make sure that they don't want for anything in retirement. We are here to pay every medical need that can possibly come our way. You know, x-rays, surgeries, prescriptions, special orthopedic bedding, wheelchairs, ramps, whatever is needed, we want to make sure we take care of it. But then also, we offer transportation. Say the military working dog retires overseas or even in a different state, and you, you now have to come out of pocket to get that dog to you. We will help fund the transportation from point A to point B. And then again, take care of any medical expenses. And we, it's not just for retired dogs. Like we're actually doing Friday. We have an active duty police canine named Athena from Oklahoma who's coming into San Antonio for a hip replacement. And then once she recovers, she'll go back out onto active duty. She's just one of those dogs who was born with really bad hips. She already had one replaced a few years ago and now is, is working on the second. So Gizmo's gift 
is really, I know I kind of explained a lot about Gizmo, but I want to make sure his story was put out there because it's about him and it's about him giving back to all of his battle buddies, you know, yeah. in the future or whatever. I mean, we want to make sure that every dog is cared for because on active duty, typically every working dog, at least that I've known um, and stories that I've been told from other, like, you know, civilian police officers, they get like the best care under the sun when they're on active duty. And then when it comes to retirement, unfortunately, many people can't afford to do what's needed. You know, with hip replacements, one of our supportive heroes, Arco, just had spinal surgery earlier this year. And another one, Shira, she had a hip replacement earlier this year, too, and were able to help out on those surgeries. And that's not something that a typical family can pay for. So we're here to help them and then also to facilitate the adoption of the dog so that I don't also want anyone who has the space for the dog, who has the love and compassion and the time that a dog needs but doesn't have the financial capability to take care of the dogs. I don't want them to not have the opportunity to not adopt one. So it's really just to make sure that these dogs go to the best home. And by doing that, we're offering the financial aspect of it. Yeah. Well, that's great work that you and Gizmo's Gift are doing. So kudos to that. And, you know, it, it's still a long way to go with uh, with the issues with military working dogs in the military because, you know, they're, as you said, they're not equipment, they're veterans, and they're living, breathing. And so at American Humane Association, we were proud to announce that Red Bank Veterinary Hospital in New Jersey has agreed to step up. They did. We announced this on Veterans Day last year to provide free specialty veterinary care for all retired military working dogs. And, you know, we're looking to hopefully get more nationwide, but uh, still some work to go. And right now, the legislation, the National Defense Authorization Act, which includes some language that we supported talking about retirement of military working dogs and giving the opportunity for their handlers to adopt. That's Mm -hmm. now, Congress is in recess now, but once they get back in session in about a month, we hope that they'll finalize the bill and send it to President Obama for his signature so we can help out more of these brave MWDs. Oh, for sure. I mean, and even with the canine members of the Armed Forces Act, that was the legislation. I actually, so what happened was that I went back to school to get my degree. I was going to school to become a veterinarian. And um, one of my credits didn't transfer, so I started to take an English class all over again. And she wanted us, the teacher wanted us to write about something that was meaningful, so I picked the military working dog and how they should get rights and, you know, benefits and, and five different ways that it could be funded. And so she hands it back to me. She's like, you need to send this to Congress. So that end point is what happened. I ended up contacting a Gold Star mom, which if people don't know what a Gold Star mom is or a family, that's when their family member is killed in action. So her son was a Marine dog handler, and he was killed in action in Iraq. And his dog Lex survived. And Lex was the first dog in military history to be adopted by the fallen military member's family. And Congressman Jones helped make that possible. So I contacted Rachel, and Rachel was like, well, let's talk to Congressman Jones. And so he brought out the Canaan Members of the Armed Forces Act based only upon the English essay. And then we got, I'm originally from Connecticut, so we got Senator Blumenthal to bring it forward on the Senate floor. And so now we've been kind of going back and forth with Jones and Blumenthal because there was a watered-down version that passed, which also did not reclassify them, and that was the whole purpose. So the reclassification finally happened officially this year, which we're so stoked about. And then the other aspect was the transportation. They changed shall to may. And so now that verbiage was just worked on again. And then there's another issue in it that we're in the works about with the award system. So there's still some tweaking that we're doing, but we're working on it. And, you know, it takes teamwork and effort on all parts. (laughs) Yep. So let me uh, just briefly, just I've been asking these same questions to all of our dogs to kind of get their feel about the Hero Dog Awards. After you nominated Rambo and then you went through the first round and we announced our semifinalists and our finalists, were you nervous to see if his name was on our list? (laughs) Oh, yes. I was really nervous, actually. We're going up against some strong dogs in our category. And when I go into things of this nature, I kind of just, I don't pay attention to anybody else. You know, this yeah. is, in my mind, it's like, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I'm just going to trek along, you know, and hopefully Rambo will make it through. But if not, it's no big deal. You know, a lot of these dogs were deployed. Like, they went overseas. They, were, they saw war in action. And so, you know, not saying that Rambo is any less of a hero. He did quite a bit stateside. 
But, um, you know, these dogs, they all, they all deserve it. So I was very nervous and very kind of excited and a little intimidated, too. And then once I got the email, I... I think I screamed a little scream of joy <laughs> and called my mom. <laughs> and, you you uh, probably weren't was, the only one. <laughs> yeah. Probably seven more people doing that. And like I was, I was at an event for Gizmo's Gift. I think I was going to another event. So like when I got the email, I was stopped at a red light, which I know is so wrong, but I was stopped at a red light, so I really didn't get to read it. I was like, oh my gosh, I just got to get home so I can read the email because I think it said that we won the category. So I got home and sure enough, it was. Yeah, I called my mom and it was amazing. And so then we, when we went to the next event, which was at Morgan's Wonderland in San Antonio, we were able to let the people know like, hey, you know, Rambo just won his category. So now we're going on to the finals. So make sure you go. And yeah, it was just, it was perfect timing. It was amazing, especially on the 4th of July. <laughs> Great. So what would it mean for Rambo to win the 2015 American Hero Dog Award? I think it would mean, or I should say probably signify like a change that we're giving more credit to these working dogs and that it's not just Rambo winning. It's, it's all military working dogs winning, especially with the movie Max Out and the Keenan of the Armed Forces Act. Their change of status from equipment happened this year. It would just be like icing on the cake for these dogs. There's just been so much movement to help support these dogs and to bring their story out to, to make sure that the world knows about what these dogs do, the lives they save. I mean, these dogs go in the building first. They are the first ones to come against any danger, and yet they put their lives in danger for nothing but a mere affection from their handler or for a toy given to them afterwards. Like, they don't sign up. They don't put their paw, like, dance their paw on the dotted line and say, okay, sign me up for another five years. So they work and they work and they work until unfortunately they can't work anymore, and then they get retired, but they do it for love. They don't get a paycheck. You know, like, they do it because they want to make their human happy. And so I think if Rambo won, it would signify a great change in the military working dog culture. You know, it would be extremely special and powerful and and very motivating, I think, for other military working dogs that are maybe wanting to join the competition in the years to come. Yeah. So have you had a chance to film your tribute video yet? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did that two weeks ago, I think. Great. That went well, I, I assume? It was so much fun. The film crew were absolutely amazing, and they really cared about Rambo, and it's really hot in San Antonio. Yeah, <laughs> I was just we in Austin. Just, <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like you can literally boil an egg out there and cook food and, and actually make like steak. I saw it on a YouTube video. I'm sorry, I digress. But yeah, it was absolutely amazing. They made sure that he was a in the water and that... You know, we were all at ease, and it was a great time, and they flew his hammer in from North Carolina, which was so special. So they got to meet up and, and see each other, and it was a great time. <laughs> yeah. Just real briefly, if you could tell us a little bit about your charity partner, America's Vet Dogs, the Veterans Canine Corps. Yeah, so America's Vet Dogs, we decided to to pick to choose them because of what they're doing for our human veterans. They're giving back to our human veterans by use of a service dog. And that is just absolutely amazing. You know, 22 veterans commit suicide every day. And with a service dog, that hopefully that number will start to decrease. Because dogs are absolutely amazing. I mean, they say, and studies are out there, that if you own an animal, you're, you supposedly live longer because it, they relax you. They keep you calm, emotionally stable. So what better organization to give back to than an organization that's not only helping supply, you know, dogs who um, are fully trained and want to work and then equip them and put them together with, with a human veteran and, and give back. I mean, that's just absolutely amazing. And we are so thrilled to pick them and, and have their support as well. Yeah. So let me just wrap up with one more question. What are you and Rambo most looking forward to in, in Los Angeles? Oh, <laughs> I'm kind of excited to see the other dogs and see, uh, especially Hudson and a few others. Like we've been following them, and I think that's just great. But I don't know. I think I'm. We're just excited for the opportunity to be there and to share our voice for the military working dogs in general. And I know Rambo is going to want to hug everybody and love everybody <laughs> with his one leg. That's what he does. <laughs> uh, so Rambo just loves people. He's. I mean, he's not dog aggressive, but he just prefers people. You know, he walk away from a dog and and go up to a human anytime. So <laughs> I think it would just be a great experience 
Um, and I can't wait to see some of the judges and, and just interact with the other humans attached to the other winners of the categories. <laughs> well, it's a real fun night. And uh, I know you and Rambo and all of our finalists will have a great time. And uh, I look forward to meeting you, Lisa, in just a few weeks. But uh, until then, I wish you and Rambo nothing but the best and uh, safe travels out to L.A. Okay. Thank you so much, Scott. All right. Thanks. Take care. And uh, we'll be right back with our next hero dog, Arson Dog Glory. This is Pet Life Radio. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. Amazing Pet Expos is coming to a city near you. Admission is always free, and your pet is welcome. Shopping, adoptions, free nail trims, discounted shots and microchipping, agility, a pet costume contest, and much more. Plus, meet the guys from Animal Planet's hit TV series Tank and Pit Boss online at AmazingPetExpos.com. Bring your pets to the Pet Expo. Calling all pet product manufacturers and pet experts. Let the public relations and marketing professionals at Whitegate PR get you featured in the news. I'm Dana Humphrey at Whitegate PR, and we have been specializing in pet product PR for over 10 years and can get your brand featured in the media from TV to radio to print to blogs. You can find out more at www.whitegatepr.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to the show. Doesn't Rambo have an amazing story? And I guarantee you that the next dog on today's show does as well. Arson is a deadly, destructive crime which costs the insurance industry billions of dollars annually. One powerful tool law enforcement agencies are using to combat arsonists is the cold, wet nose of a dog. A dog's nose is thousands of times more powerful than yours or mine, and specially trained arson dogs are able to go to suspected arson scenes and detect if things like gasoline, lighter fluid, kerosene, or other common accelerants were used to start the fire. With this evidence, law enforcement agencies can then arrest the perpetrators. And this year's finalist in our arson dog category, sponsored by State Farm, is Glory, a proud member of the City of Beloit Fire Department. On the phone with us now is Keith Lynn, an arson investigator with the Beloit Fire Department and Glory's dad. Hi, Keith. How are you today? Good. How are you? So is Glory there with you now? I think you said you were recording at the station, fire station? Yeah, we're recording at the station, and she's lying on my bed right now, oh, taking a little nap. Hard at work. <laughs> so I understand you and Glory have been partnered up for about two years. Uh, how many cases have you guys done together? Um, in a two-year period, uh, Glory's worked uh, approximately just over 100 fire scenes. And probably about uh, 30% of those have been taken to uh, actual arson cases. Is arson a big problem there in Beloit? Yeah, um, over the past few years, uh, we run uh, anywhere averaging from about 25 to at least 40 and sometimes 50%. We call them incendiary fires, and that's when we bring the dog in and then she finds evidence that's left over to kind of prove maybe a case, which when, it, when a charge goes with it, then it turns into a being an arson fire. So for our listeners who might not be familiar with how uh, arson dogs work, can you give us a kind of walk us through your day and what a typical investigation is like once you get the call? Well, um, when we get the call, um, I usually respond to the scene and then I take a walk through the fire scene. Obviously, when the fire is out, um, I take a walk through the fire scene to make sure it's safe for the dog to go in. And then uh, basically, uh, I put the dog on lead and they work on food reward. So I go into the fire scene and I give her a command to uh, actually go to the sneak command. And then she starts sniffing through the debris and when she finds uh, any trace of an accelerant, she'll actually go to a seated position and she'll point to it with her nose and then I give her a food reward. And then we continue to do that several times and then I remove her from the fire scene and then I go back and collect evidence. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, I actually, a couple years ago, I had the opportunity to, to travel the country with several arson dogs as part of the National Fire Dog Monument Tour. And I had never knew that the arson dogs, they never will eat during their working lives out of a bowl. It's always out of someone's hand. Can you tell people why that is? Um, what we do is we, we try to uh, develop that bond. And any time the dog eats, he has to sniff some odor and then give an indication. So throughout the day, um, what we do is we take in, we'll put uh, plants and we'll play little games where the dog is sniffing odor. They're giving an indication on that odor and then we're rewarding them with the food. And then usually, you know, every handler will wear a food pouch and we feed them right from our hand. 
And it does two things. It associates the dog with the odor, but then it also uh, lets the dog know that it is dependent upon you, and that helps to make the dog have more drive to actually please you when you have that kind of bond. So they'll work a lot harder for you in the fire scenes because, believe it or not, there's a lot of things that we ask these dogs to do for us that the normal person wouldn't do, but they are happy to do it because they have that bond with you. Yeah, and I know that the bond, you know, really gets started from day one because a lot of the arson investigators who work with the State Farm program, they, they go to Maine to be paired up with their dog and, and form that bond right off the bat. Can you talk a little bit about the experience of, of what it's like to do that and, and what you go through and, and how you're paired up? Well, being that Glory is actually my third dog, I had the opportunity to go out to Maine three times now. And uh, you basically go out there and then the, the, the trainer kind of gets to know you a little bit and he pairs you up with a with a canine that he feels would work best with your personality. Um, I was fortunate enough this last time that I was able to pick the dog that I wanted out of uh, several different dogs. So I kind of handled the dogs a little bit and I picked the one that I thought would work best with my personality. And they don't normally do that, but they did it solely based because this is my third dog and, and I'm a very seasoned handler when it comes to working arts and dogs. And uh, you basically get paired up with a dog, and you spend five weeks of that period learning about uh, the personality of the dog and learning how they work fire scenes, and then they transition you into actually getting to a point where the dog's fully trained, working with you as a team, and then uh, they certify you, and then they send you home to work in your communities. Talk a little bit about, so the, you know, Glory's your third dog, so what were your other two dogs like? What were their names, and what was your career with them like? Um, my first dog I got back in 1996 in the spring. His name was uh, Bobo. Um, mm-hmm. He's kind of a big clowny dog. Uh, I called him a southern dog. He liked to lay around, but <laughs> he was very uh, playful and fun. And he was actually from a litter of pups that were put out for, they, they were just a litter of pups where they had a bunch of extra dogs and, and the, the main uh, specialty canines actually picked them up and trained them. I worked uh, him for several years and he developed cancer in his hips and uh, he went through treatment and everything, and then they decided just to uh, deactivate him or actually retire him. And then I got my second dog in 2003, and um, her name was Molly, and she was actually raised in a uh, women's prison in Maine, and she was wow. raised to be a seeing eye dog. So when I got her, she was two years old, and uh, she was actually trained to be a seeing eye dog, so they kind of transitioned her over into doing the arts program. And then I worked her for roughly nine and a half years, and then they decided that, hey, she's an older dog, let's just retire her early, and then they paired me up with Glory. And the idea was that I'm getting older in my career, and then uh, I'll work Glory out for the rest of her career, and then I'll actually be retiring at the same time. So um, they kind of paired me up with the dogs, it's based on the number of years. Um, so, you know, those are the other dogs that I had. And, you know, now I have Glory. <laughs> is Molly still with you? Is she live at home, retired? Yes, she is. Yep. Uh, she's 15 years old now, and she's wow. a grouchy, grumpy dog. <laughs> <laughs> but so she you, deserved it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You talked a little bit about the background of, of your first two dogs. What's uh, Glory's background? How did she get into the arson dog program? Glory was actually an assistance dog for a handicapped girl, and she went through two years of training. I believe that they told me she was kind of at like a level four. So um, she was actually trying to do assistance, like uh, opening doors and picking up things and getting stuff off counters and stuff to help people with handicap needs. And she developed uh, separation anxiety really bad, and it didn't work out doing that type of job because, of course, handicapped people have to doctor's appointments and stuff, and then, and then she gets uh, rather upset and it kind of really... She becomes a real bad dog when she's when she's separated. And then uh, they moved over to the arson dog program, and actually her separation anxiety actually works as a benefit towards us because it helps her develop that bond a lot faster with the handler because they do go everywhere with you. They go on vacation with you. They go to work. Uh, they go home with you. And they basically spend 365 days with you. So that, that bond actually developed and makes, that, makes the dog want to do so much more for you. Yeah. Um, and so that was kind of her history behind it, and that's how she ended up in that arson program. Okay. You know, and, and arson dogs just really are so important to our country. They're just such a powerful tool. And, you know, a couple of years ago, we were proud to, to partner with State Farm with the National Fire Dog Monument, which was the brainchild of Jerry Means and Sadie, who was our inaugural arson dog winner back in first Hero Dog Awards in 2011. And have you had a chance to see the monument yet? It's, it's just a, a really powerful depiction of the bond that you talk about between handler and dog. 
Yes, I have. I've been out to D.C. twice, and we actually saw it when it came through uh, Illinois here. And I knew Jerry, I think when he started in on Dogs is when I met Jerry. So we're kind of a small, tight-knit group. And, you know, we have handlers all over the United States, but we run across paths from here and there during canine research and stuff. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I have seen it. I'm very, very proud of it. And, uh, you know, we talk about the arson dogs being a good thing for the community, but they do have, they have two jobs, actually. They work as an arson dog, you know, putting criminals behind bars, but they also work as a PR tool yeah. um, to get uh, fire departments or police departments have more of a, a connection with the community, knowing that they're out there doing a job for them, and it's to help build that bond and helps draw the community to support these departments. Yeah, I know one thing that we've learned about these arson dogs is that they're used a lot in demonstrations, especially with kids, to teach them fire safety and talk about arson. And, you know, it's, it's a fun way to learn about, about fire safety just because they have a, a friendly dog there to teach it to them. Yeah, every uh, October during fire prevention week, I go out and do stuff in the schools. And uh, we used to get around for little lunch programs and stuff. And then the uh, majority of the stuff that I do, I mean, I talk about the dogs and everything, but we just get the dogs out with the kids. And we'll go out on the playground and we'll throw the ball for them. The dogs will be playing with the kids and the kids are chasing them around and stuff. And it's just that connection that the kids have with the dog. And they associate it with the fire department as being something good and something to help. And then we have other people in our department that go into to the classrooms and they sit down and teach about fire education and fire safety. And then there's also a lot of stuff I get involved too with doing uh, adult learning about fire. I go to uh, you know, Kiwanis meetings and uh, Rotary and Night to Columbus and I get out and I get involved with adult education, you know, teaching them about the problem that arson does. You know, arson isn't something you see on the TV every single day, but it's something that does happen every day. And, and if you look, start looking at the dollars lost from arson, it gets rather high and even lives lost for arson. It gets rather high, but it seems to be that that's one of those crimes that's kind of overlooked. And we're trying to get out and educate the public that, you know, it is out there. And, you know, this is something that if we fight this crime, it'll help you in the long run because it, it, that means insurance companies don't have to pay on claims that they don't rightfully have to pay. And that way that we all don't share in that loss. People don't really appreciate how damaging arson can be to communities, to nature, and to certainly lives are lost every year due to it. So it's, it's really great to see that we now have these dogs who are out there on the front lines trying to reduce the number of arson cases in this country every year. And I, I have no doubt that that's happened. And, you know, with the National Fire Dog Monument, it really does draw attention. It's a really nice, prominent place down in, in D.C. for our listeners who are in the nation's capital. It's at 500 F Street Northwest. And last year, the Washington Post ran a contest in March called Monument Madness, where they asked the public to vote for the best monument in Washington, D.C. And wouldn't you know it, the National Fire Dog Monument actually won out, beating major monuments like the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial. So... It's now the officially the best monument in a city full of monuments. So yeah, and us arson folk and arson dog group, we have a large community following too. I mean, even Glory has her own Facebook page, and she's on Twitter, and we do a lot of public relations stuff to get the word out there. So she has a pretty strong following, and, and so do the other dogs that are out there. Yeah, do you want to give a quick shout out to your Facebook and Twitter pages, just so people can check them out? <laughs> um, I believe it's GloryWin.3 for the Facebook, and I'm not really certain what her Twitter is. Uh, my wife kind of runs that for me, and uh, she has my computer all set up, and I just go in and shoot those <laughs> out. <so. laughs> all right, no it's, problem. It's always, it's always nice, to have, nice to have a significant other that kind of helps with some of this stuff. <laughs> Don't I know it. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me just ask you, when, when you and Glory aren't on the job, what's she like just kind of off-duty? She's just kind of a plain old dog. Uh, she just lays around and we play ball and we go for walks. And uh, when they're off duty, they're they basically just chill and they're just a normal dog. Um, I have other dogs in my in my household and uh, she plays with them. And but uh, you certainly know that when you're getting up in the morning and you're putting your uniform on to go to work, that she changes her attitude a little bit because she knows yeah. that she's gonna gonna go into work and do a job. And then we I also have another family here at the fire station too that you know she enjoys having fun with all the guys here at work too. Yeah. All right. So now I'm just going to run through some questions that I've been asking all of our finalists this year just to kind of get their feeling about things. After you nominated Glory, were you nervous to see if she made it on to the semifinalist and the finalist rounds of the contest? 
I wouldn't say I was nervous. I never really jump into things expecting the, the most out of it. I look at what you get out of it in, in every moment. And one of the things that I really push is, you know, the State Farm Program and the Arson Dog Program. And, and if the Hero Dog thing is a little opportunity to get some public notice, you're basically getting out there and you're pushing everything that you do from a day-to-day basis. It's just getting pushed out on a larger scale. Um, yeah. I think it's awesome that she yeah, that she's won and moved on to the you know the last final round. And by no means it has done wonders for us as far as social media and getting our word out there. And it's, and it's more a word about public safety and then uh, you know raising money for certain charities to that support you know canine programs that yeah. Uh, that help things grow. That's a you know another good thing that, that I get out of it. So yeah, what would it mean for you for Glory to be named the 2015 American Hero Dog? I think it would mean uh, you know that I guess uh, that the public has picked uh, us as the number one dog or the top dog. <laughs> um, I mean, by no means. I mean, it's, it's more of a public uh, voting thing, and and it's up to us as as a team to go out and promote ourselves. But I mean, you can look at all the dogs, and 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 I might even say there's there's other dogs that might be more deserving, and if they win, that's great because I think every dog in every category in the whole Hero Dog Awards actually wins a little bit because you're getting the public to notice, and you're getting them to kind of look at things a little differently and maybe support some of these programs. Definitely, and one way we get the public to notice is with the tribute videos that we show every year of the dogs in action. Have you had a chance to film Lori's tribute video yet? Yes, we did. Uh, we did it last week on Monday and Tuesday, and we had a blast. That was the most fun that I've had in uh, <laughs> quite a while. <laughs> I mean, it was just a great time. I can't wait to see it. Uh, and you were mentioning earlier the charities that are involved. As a reminder, all the hero dogs, when they nominate their dog, they uh, select a charity partner. They're charities that advance the work between humans and dogs. And for every category winner, which Gloria is one of, they receive $2,500 donation in the dog's name to continue their work. And whoever our American hero dog is will receive another $5,000 donation in their name to help these charities continue their work. So talk a little bit about Glory's charity, Project Paws Alive. She's uh, Her charity is Project Paws Alive, and it's an organization that actually uh, they raise funds to provide protective vests for law enforcement canines. I know Glory has a protective vest that she wears that we, that we acquired through vested interests. And uh, we just felt that, you know, because we've got protective vests for her, that maybe we should pick a charity that's going to do the same thing for other law enforcement canines out there because they're not cheap and uh, yeah. they're actually good for five years and you have to buy another one. That's life-saving work, literally. Yeah. Yeah. So talk a little bit about what you're most excited about for the trip to L.A. for the Hero Dog Awards. Um, I think I'm uh, excited about, you know, going out and meeting some celebrities and, you know, <laughs> getting out in the public eye. I think, uh, you know, when you meet Blur, you're going to actually probably adore her. And she's a real cute dog and she really likes to uh, play up to the camera, so to speak. So, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting. And I'm just uh, going to go out and have some fun and, uh, you know, promote the dog programs and I certainly can't wait to meet Glory. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because this year, this is not the only Glory we have as a finalist. We have our Search and Rescue Dog of the Year, who we talked with a couple weeks ago on the show, Glory. And both of them are using their noses to do their job. So it's pretty amazing to have two Glories, huh? Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us this week, Keith. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate all you and your colleagues at the fire department do. So keep up the great work and uh, safe travels to L.A. Oh, you're welcome, and uh, you, you uh, have a good evening, too. All right, thank you. And uh, stay tuned. We're just going to come right back and wrap up today's show. Thanks for joining us on Pet Life Radio. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com 
Pet Life Radio, the number one pet radio network on the planet, joins forces with iHeartRadio to put the power of your pets in your pocket. Awesome. Download the iHeartRadio app and rock Pet Life Radio on your phone, on your tablet, on your Xbox, in your car. Pet talk, pet tunes, and fun pet times. Pet Life Radio and iHeartRadio. Positively possum. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Thank you, Scott, for those terrific interviews. And thanks so much for being on the road with our hero dogs. Congratulations to Rambo, DeGlory, and all of our 2015 Hero Dog Awards finalists. To vote for any of these dogs to be our 2015 American Hero Dog, please log on to HeroDogAwards.org. And it's your last chance as voting closes in just a few days on September 7th. Remember, you can vote for one dog every day until then can't decide well you're welcome to vote for different dogs on different days well that's all the time we have for today thanks for listening and i hope you have a happy humane labor day weekend take care and tune in next week for another round of meeting our hero dog awards thank you and remember to be humane let's talk pets every week on demand only on petliferadio.com